Hey, good morning, everyone. How's it going? Y'all can hear me. Hey, good morning. Hope everyone's doing well. Got three class sessions left. We're rounding the end of the bend here. Uh, can anyone remind me, did we finish up the cardio section last time or are we still working on that? Don't think we did. I don't think we did either now that I'm looking at it. Oh, okay, there you go. Makes sense. Mm. I remember now. The time's a flat circle. Yes, this is work. <clears throat> Start here in just a minute. And again, if you have questions, post them up in the chat or uh, on the sticky board. That would be helpful. And I did post up your um, third prescription assignment. I'm going to get the second one probably graded this weekend. Um, and then you guys will be ready for that. So. Uh, you can see that posted one more spot. <laughs> so you can see the third assignment there posted up on section three. I also put it on the home page, so you have access to that. Okay, let's um let's kick this off. Do you guys have any questions before we hop into this? I know we cover a lot of the electrophysiology and all of that of the heart. All right, my recording's going, so it should be good. Okay, so um, welcome back. I think we have uh, about three more sessions left, so uh, rapidly approaching the end of our time together for this semester, so I'm sure you all are quite excited. Happy, was it Friday the 13th? Oh my goodness. This is what we need in 2020 more. More good fortune for ourselves. Anyway, so we, we covered the typical electrophysiology of the heart. We saw that, you know, things can certainly go wrong uh, when we have arrhythmias. And so now we're going to get into the specific drugs on how we're going to be able to treat those. Um, so again, understanding what type of ion movements happening at various stages of the action potential is critical understand how these drugs are going to be affecting these, right? So we basically can break these up into sort of four main classes, and then we have kind of like a miscellaneous kind of junk drawer kind of class here. Um, so class one are going to be just sodium channel blockers, right? So they're mainly going to be affecting phase zero of the, um, uh, in those fast response cells, blocking that rapid influx of sodium, right? Very early on in the action potential. Uh, within class one, you can find three subcategories. So class one A, one B, and one C. You're going to find that they'll have various activities at the um, various stages of the sodium channel. If you recall, there was sort of like an inactive phase, a closed phase, and an open phase. And so they will have a tendency to affect one of those uh, over the others, as, as you'll see there. So we'll get into those. Um, class two is your beta receptor antagonist. That should be pretty easy because we're going to just talk about them as antiarrhythmics. 
Um, but remember for the test, like, you know, talking about beta blockers, you still got to know stuff about beta blockers, even if it was on last um, exams test or last sections test. Now, am I going to talk specifically about how you use beta blockers to treat heart failure? Well, no, I'm going to talk about them in the context of treating arrhythmias. But you should still know stuff like the difference between a cardioselective and non-selective beta blocker. You should still know common side effects, you know, mechanisms, things like that. Because, um, you know, I don't want you guys just to dump everything after an exam. This stuff is going to come up again and again. Um, you know, especially these classes that have kind of multiple uses, like, you know, all your cardiac drugs will have. You know, we'll talk about beta blockers again when we get into the um, uh, behavioral med stuff because you can use it for anxiety. For panic attacks, right? So lots of places this stuff will come up again. So you gotta be able to retain that and keep it in your mind. Class three will be another new set of drugs here, or these are gonna be blocking outward um, flow of potassium, They're blocking the uh, delayed rectifier channels there. So this is gonna be affecting the repolarization phase of the action potential. Uh, and then class four is again, is gonna be another review. These are gonna be our non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. So basically for and diltiazem. And then we'll have a few, uh, you know, miscellaneous ones like adenosine and then digoxin. So what are our indications here? Um, the main thing I want you to, to focus on are kind of the general areas where these drugs are working. Um, you know, I could get into really specific um, indications of like different types of specific arrhythmias. It's kind of outside of our scope and I don't think it's gonna do us any good to get that granular with it at this point. The main thing I want you to know is that if a drug is working on kind of slowing down nodal conduction from the SA to AV node down into the ventricles, um, that's going to be good for atrial arrhythmias, okay? One of the things we're going to see is that when you have like an atrial arrhythmia, um, the problem is not so much that the atria are not pumping in a very efficient manner because honestly the atria don't really do a whole lot of work in terms of blood flow and contributing to cardiac output. But if they are sending a really rapid signal down into the ventricles to where they're pumping at like, you know, 180, 200 beats a minute, it's very difficult for the um, the ventricles to keep up with that, right? And so then they become very inefficient because they don't have enough fill time. They um, can tire out. And so that's where you run into some big issues. So if something is working on slowing down that conduction from the atria into the ventricles, slowing down that signal to a manageable heart rate, then those are going to be things like your beta blockers, your calcium channel blockers here. Those are mainly going to be treating atrial arrhythmias. They won't do anything to an arrhythmia that is generated in the ventricles. Okay. What we're going to see here is in general, class one, all the class one, uh, one drugs, and class three are going to be good for both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. They can kind of work for both. They're kind of broad spectrum. Class two and four are mainly going to be working on superventricular arrhythmias, meaning anything originating above the ventricles. Okay. We'll get into those more specifically in a little bit, and you'll see the miscellaneous agents, kind of a similar um, spectrum of activity. So if you recall with our sodium channel, you can see here kind of has three different states. The resting state where it's just waiting for an action potential to come along. Again, this is not in a pacemaker cell. This is like those fast response cells um, found in the atria and the ventricles. They will have an activated state that's during phase zero of that depolarization, and then they'll have during that refractory period, if you recall, there's a um, a absolute refractory period and then a relative refractory period. Um, you're going to see here, this is where uh, the inactivated state comes into play. This is what's contributing to that thing where no matter what kind of signal you've come along, no matter how strong it is, you cannot have another action potential while the sodium is in the inactivated state, while these channels here it just can't happen. So because of that, we're going to see that some drugs will have different affinities for either the resting state or more so the inactivated state or maybe even the activated state here. So, Looking at this, starting with our class 1A antiarrhythmics, there's three drugs in this category. And so I always remember this class by the um, acronym PDQ. I always thought that meant pretty darn quick, but I guess people now think it means chicken tenders. Go figure. Um, but anyway, so we'll find there's three drugs there that fit into that category, and that's how I used it to, to memorize that. Um, so we'll get into those in just a moment here. But what, what did the class 1A antiarrhythmics do? Basically, they're going to help to prolong the action potential by affecting the open sodium channel, right? So they'll block that and prevent that inward flux of sodium. So what you can see here is it takes longer for the action potential to occur. So it kind of extends that out. And then it also leads to overall of a lower peak, right? So 
what that means is, is that you're going to see an extension. It takes longer for that depolarization to occur. So how might that manifest on the EKG? Well, if you remember that when you see the ventricular depolarization, that's the beginning of your QRS wave, right? So if I were to then delay this, what you might expect to see is your QRS actually lengthens. You'd actually see a widening of the QRS interval, right? So I want you to kind of think about how these drugs are going to be affecting your EKG because this is what you can see. You're not going to see this individual ventricular cell firing and seeing that difference there. You're going to be looking at the overall picture of the heart with an EKG, and that's what you're going to be seeing there. So anyway, so main thing I want you to focus on here is more of the main actions. Am I going to ask you specifically on the test, does it affect the open versus inactive? Probably not. Um, I'm not going to ask you the dissociation time. Probably not. But I do want you to know the different categories that these drugs fit into and their overall mechanism of blocking sodium channels, okay, and how they slow phase zero of the action potential and they're slowing down conduction, okay. The first one in this group here is quinidine. This is actually an isomer of a drug called quinine. Quinine is kind of a uh, old school anti-malarial drug. Um, and it's actually kind of in the same, it's a, a congener, the same sort of chemical family as uh, hydroxychloroquine. So they're all kind of in the same little category there. This actually comes from a tree called the Sincona tree. That Sincona name will come up here in just a minute. Um, and also another little um, tidbit for you, um, if you ever, uh, you know, back before the COVID times, you know, approximately 50 years ago, uh, people used to gather in, in large numbers and especially in, uh, in uh, you know, rooms with loud music and, and uh, you know, alcoholic beverages. Uh, these places were called clubs. I've never actually been to one. So as far as I know, it could be a, a myth. But um Basically, if you ever, uh, you know, they'd have a lot of like black lights in these clubs and things like that. Um, and some drinks under the black light actually glow. You're like, wow, that's really fantastic. How does that drink glow like that? And it's actually due to the quinine that you can find in tonic water. So if someone has like a gin and tonic or some, something and it's legit tonic water and it's underneath black light, it'll actually glow. Just kind of neat because that quinine. But anyway. If you take one of those isomers out of that, you'd actually have quinidine, which has, um, and again, it's usually very small amounts you'd find in that tonic water, so it's not going to hopefully give you an arrhythmia. Um, but anyway, so quinidine here, the first one, so this is going to, again, slow down conduction from the atria to the ventricles. It's going to prolong the refractory period. This is important. You have a longer refractory period, meaning it's more difficult for an aberrant signal coming from, say, like an ectopic foci or something from coming in and activating a new... Uh, new action potential. So that's important. So it's going to interrupt these arrhythmias from happening any further because you're prolonging that refractory period. Okay. It's also going to increase that threshold for excitability. So it's more difficult for those cells to fire off in the first place. And it also will decrease automaticity. So you can see how it works kind of both for ventricular and atrial arrhythmias in, in the fact that it's kind of broad spectrum like that because it's able to affect kind of both uh, both halves of the heart there, right? Um, kind of top and bottom halves, I should say. So other indirect actions you're going to have here, and this is what leads to some of the side effects. It can have some anticholinergic activity, which means blocking the effects of uh, acetylcholine on the heart. So we'll see some effects there. And they can actually act as an alpha blocker at higher doses. So think about drugs like um, uh, prazosin or doxazosin, how those can lead to like orthostatic hypotension. That same effect can be seen here to some degree, especially with higher doses. So what do we use these for? And again, Am I going to get super specific on the individual arrhythmias? Probably not. But again, broadly speaking, these are going to be broad spectrum. They can affect both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias. And so one of the topics we'll get into is this idea of rhythm versus rate control. Um, rhythm control means you're trying to put the patient back into a normal sinus rhythm. Okay, These drugs are going to be able to do that. Generally, class 1 and class 3 antiarrhythmics are better for rhythm control, trying to get that patient back in a normal sinus rhythm. Class two and four, your beta blockers and calcium channel blockers respectively are gonna be better for um, rate control. Those are gonna just try to control the rate of the heart to make sure your ventricles can still beat at a um, in, in an efficient manner, right? So that way the ventricular rate's not going through the roof. So, um, and if you ever hear the term cardioversion, Cardioversion just means you're trying to convert the heart back into a normal sinus rhythm. And there's two main ways you can do that. You can do that with electricity, you can defibrillate the patient, uh, or you can do that with chemical means. So if you ever hear of a chemical cardioversion, 
typically they're using like a class one or a class three antiarrhythmic to switch that patient back into normal sinus rhythm. We can see here um, that uh, these patients here uh, can use something like uh, quinidine for controlling um, that rhythm, either in patients with AFib or flutter, for instance, they can help to control VTAC, um, or they can help to convert patients um, who are in AFib or flutter back over to normal sinus. Now, this is not done as frequently anymore. There are some issues with this. And again, remember that if your atria are just sitting there quivering, they're in fibrillation or they're in flutter, um, that tends to lead to pooling of the blood, which can lead to clots. And so you do really worry about patients um, developing, um, you know, like ischemic strokes uh, due to throwing one of those clots out of the atria once you put it back into normal sinus rhythm. So that's why frequently anticoagulants are needed at the same time these patients are getting converted there. Um, so those are the general uses for the, for the drug quinidine. You're gonna see this is gonna apply basically to all the 1A antiarrhythmics for the most part. Um, for clinical interactions, again, you do wanna be cautious here because the drug itself is a 2D6 inhibitor, which means it can affect drugs like codeine and morphine. So if you're not metabolizing morphine as well, that means you can have higher levels of it and that can lead to side effects of opioids um, like you know CNS and respiratory depression, things like that. So a lot of toxicity with these drugs, which is why we don't use them quite as frequently anymore. A um, lot of nausea, vomiting associated with this. Um, it, and again, any of these drugs themselves can induce arrhythmia, so you do want to be cautious with that. Um, hypotension due to some of the alpha blocking effects there. You can see some blood dyscrasias, things like thrombocytopenia can actually develop here. So that can actually be fatal. It's something you definitely want to watch for if you had a patient on quinidine. Now, interesting, there's a, a very classic side effect that's associated with quinidine, and this is something called synchonism, and it goes back to the tree that these drugs are uh, come from, the synchona tree, by that name, come, uh, is synchonism there, and it's this uh, trifecta of side effects that are very unique to this particular drug. So again, this is why I mention it, because it's unique. You might get a question about this if you had a preceptor who was in cardiology, perhaps, they didn't they try to pimp you, and you can bust out this little tidbit of information to really impress them, or you might find it on the boards, right? So um, the three things you're gonna find here is gonna be tinnitus, dizziness, and blurred vision, right? You're not gonna see this with any of the other antiarrhythmics we'll talk about today. Um, now, this quinidine sudden death is probably not something you'd wanna tell your patient about. Say, hey, guess what? There's this rare side effect called quinidine sudden death you might experience. Probably not gonna instill them with a whole lot of confidence. What you're going to see here is that um, as you extend that phase zero de depolarization, I mentioned that your QRS is going to extend, right? The QRS can extend. Um, well, if your QRS is extending, that by nature is going to be affecting also your QTC, right? Because again, QTC goes from the Q to the T wave. Um, and so as you extend that QTC, your risk for arrhythmias like torsades goes up, right? And so you can have cases of patients who are kind of going along doing their own thing, all of a sudden they just collapse, syncopize, and you're like, what the heck's going on here? Frequently, if they're on something like quinidine, it's due to the fact they probably went into torsades or some sort of ventricular arrhythmia, and then they pass out from that, right? Because this, their cardiac output essentially goes to zero, they don't perfuse the head anymore, and they pass out. So that is something you can see with there. We'll talk about the treatment of torsades a little bit later and uh, the drug of choice for that. Um, and you can get some rare immunologic reactions to this drug as well. You can see why we don't use these drugs quite so often anymore, but at the time, it's kind of what we had. Okay, switching over, now we have the P of PDQ. This is procainamide. Um, this is actually going to be uh, a derivative of a drug called procaine, which anytime you see the, the uh, suffix cane on a drug, like lidocaine, it usually means it's a local anesthetic. So in the way that local anesthetics work, so say you get a, a laceration, and you wanted to numb up that area so that you could suture it, you normally will infiltrate that area with a local anesthetic. Now, how do you block painful signals from being transmitted up into your brain? Well, you block the action potentials. How do you do that? Block sodium channels. So you can see there's a little bit of crossover here between deadening those nerves that send painful signals by blocking action potentials, by blocking sodium channels, and you can also block sodium channels on the heart as well, and I can actually see some crossover there. So we'll talk about lidocaine just a little bit. Anyway, um, so very similar action as quinidine. The side effect profile is gonna be a little different here, though. That's the main differentiator between the different 1A antiarrhythmics here. This one has a little bit less anticholinergic activity, so less side effects from that standpoint. Um, but this one, interestingly enough, has an active metabolite. So it's called NAPA, or N-acetyl, 
procainamide. Uh, and so this actually has a little bit of class three activity as well. It's a little bit of potassium channel blocking ability. But the thing is, is that this drug undergoes acetylation. We've talked about acetylation before. You may be thinking, I don't remember what you're talking about. That's okay, because I was on the last test. You might have dumped it. But hydralazine, if you remember, hydralazine underwent acetylation, right? What kind of side effect do we see with patients who are slow acetylators? Well, if they don't acetylate it fast enough, they can accumulate the drug. That can lead to that lupus-like reaction we talked about lead to side effects from the drug. The same thing can happen here with procainamide. You do want to be watchful for that. However, though, you can have patients who are fast acetylators, and so they actually can produce a lot more of this active metabolite, this NAPA, which can lead to different activity, this class three activity, which we'll kind of delve into more in, a little bit later in this lecture here. So just know they have patients who are slow acetylators, they can build up the parent drug procainamide, which can lead to some effects. If they're fast acetylators, they can build up a lot of the active metabolite, which may have different effects, as we'll see. Um, big things you're going to see here, a little bit of hypotension, probably a little bit less than what you're going to see with quinidine. And I talked about that lupus-like syndrome in patients who are slow acetylators, usually like Caucasian patients. Uh, women tend to be more at risk for this. Again, about 25 to 50% of patients, um, you can see, develop this, this rash, right? So again, not a drug we use super, super commonly. Very niche sort of cases here. Um, you know, more so if you're like working in cardiology specifically or something like that. And of course, you mentioned torsades being a risk as well. Again, it all has to do with that QTC prolongation um, due to, um, you know, you're extending out the QRS interval. So of course, that's going to affect the QTC as well. All right, and the last one here is going to be disapyramide or norpace. Um, this is going to have pretty similar effects to quinidine minus the synchronism and all of that. Um, Again, probably a little bit more anticholinergic effects you're going to see with that, and also some negative inotropic effects. So the contractility of the heart will be affected a little bit by this drug as well. And, you know, as I mentioned, class 1 antiarrhythmics are good for both ventricular and atrial arrhythmias. It can do both. In terms of side effects, there's nothing like super specific here, um, like we saw with the other two. Um, but due to that decrease in contractility, you do want to be watchful for patients who have CHF because by decreasing contractility, obviously their cardiac output can be affected. And those patients are more at risk for that. Okay, so then switching gears, now we have our 1B antiarrhythmics. This one's relatively easy because it is just one drug we're gonna be talking about. So this is actually gonna be where lidocaine comes into play. So this one's kind of interesting because it more so affects the inactivated channel as opposed to the open sodium channel. So instead of extending out the QRS interval or affecting the um, the depolarization phase, what you actually end up finding is it's going to actually cause a shortening of this phase here, the actual um, the repolarization phase. It causes it to be take less time. And so what's really neat about these is they actually have a primary effect on ischemic tissue, but they have very little effect on normal tissue. So when do you have ischemic tissue in the heart? Well, probably when you're having myocardial ischemia, right? So you have any NMI. And so for a long time, we're gonna, uh, we'll see that lidocaine is actually a drug of choice for ventricular arrhythmias due to MI. Um, because basically what they did was they affected um, ischemic tissue to help kind of shorten up their action potential. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, because dead tissue does not conduct electricity very well, right, or dying tissue. Um, so you'd find that that area of ischemia would take longer to conduct those action potentials, and that in itself could lead to an arrhythmia. So by shortening that up and trying to get it to act more like normal tissue, you can prevent that arrhythmia from occurring or convert them out of the arrhythmia back to normal sinus rhythm there. So lidocaine, you can see here, um, you know, very commonly used as a local anesthetic when given IV. It's always being used as an antiarrhythmic here. So um, you can use it for patients with having PVCs, particular tachycardias. Um, you know, mainly you're going to see this with acute MI. That's really the biggest place you might see this being used. Um, you know, if you look at your ACLS protocols, like for cardiac arrest, lidocaine is used to be kind of a go-to antiarrhythmic. That is less so the case nowadays, but you can still see it being used in some rare instances, things like Will Parkinson White and things like that. So um, lidocaine itself, when used as an antiarrhythmic, I mentioned will be given IV because orals has very high first pass metabolism, so it won't really get into the systemic circulation. Um, as I mentioned, it's going to be mostly effective on uh, sodium channels and ischemic tissue. Okay, 
um, less so effect on normal tissue. That's at normal dosing. At high doses, you can end up inducing arrhythmias in, in normal tissue as well. Okay. Now, this one itself is not really effective against atrial arrhythmias. More so, and again, if you think about, you know, someone having an MI, it's rare they have an MI specifically affecting the atria because they don't require as much oxygen as the ventricles do. So it makes sense why this is typically given more so for ventricular arrhythmias. Okay, so what do we worry about lidocaine? Well, just like I mentioned that, you know, local anesthetics can um, inhibit action potentials on our nerves to send those painful signals. They can do the same thing in the CNS as well. So CNS toxicity is a big concern here. And you'll have patients who will be maybe getting too much lidocaine Maybe they have hepatic or renal insufficiency and they can't clear the drug very well. And so they start to complain of like a metallic taste in their mouth or they start to have nystagmus, which you can find by having them follow your eye or follow your finger in their eyes. <clears throat> and so that can lead all the way to developing seizures. So you do want to be watchful for this. Um, go back and reassess your patient to make sure they're not having developing any of these signs of CNS toxicity because seizures due to drugs tend to be a little bit more difficult to treat than a seizure due to you know, more of an organic cause there. Um, some, pa some patients may also have hypersensitivity to certain anesthetics like lidocaine, so you do want to be um, make sure, making sure you're asking about, um, you know, prior allergies before giving this drug as well. Okay, uh, and then finally we have our class 1C antiarrhythmics. There's only two drugs in this category here. You're going to find uh, flecainide and propafenone. These are going to be um, kind of even stronger versions than the 1A antiarrhythmics. They also affect the open channels here, but you can notice much more of a, a notable prolongation of the action potential here, and they also dissociate very slow from that receptor. Um, so again, all, broad spectrum going to be affecting both atrial and ventricular arrhythmias um, equally well. And so, um, Flecainide, the first one we're talking about here, actually has a little bit of a mix between class one and class three uh, actions here, because you notice here it does have some potassium channel blocking abilities, uh, again, slowing down recovery of the sodium channel, slowing down the action potentials, taking longer for that to occur. As I mentioned, you can see that affecting PR interval, which is again, interval from uh, the atrial uh, depolarization into the ventricular depolarization, QRS, QT, QTC, everything gets prolonged, right? Um, now these are typically oral drugs being given. I see this a lot more in patients with like congenital heart defects or patients who have had um, like open heart surgery and things like that. So I see this used occasionally. Now again, you working in, say you go into primary care, you're probably not gonna be the people that are prescribing these. And in fact, it would probably be a bad idea for you to do that because um, these drugs can be quite dangerous because if you're prescribing it incorrectly or to the wrong people, you can definitely cause them to go into torsades and die, right? You don't wanna do that. Um, however, you may run into patients who are taking this that you are also taking care of. So um, their cardiologist has recommended this for them, has prescribed them this, but now you're taking care of them. So while you may not be the person doing the prescribing, you still will have to be taking care of patients who are on these drugs. So you gotta know what they're being used for, the side effects you're looking for, and know if you're adding on new drugs, how they might be interacting and cause some issues there. So just be aware of that. Um, now, if you ever hear the term pill in a pocket, pill in a pocket is basically a strategy for using meds as needed um, based off of um, certain conditions that the patients will be educated on. So for instance, if you have someone who is in AFib intermittently, right, so they have kind of intermittent AFib and they feel like they're going into a bout of AFib, they can have something like flecainine prescribed to them as needed. So that way, if they feel like they're going into it, they can go ahead and take one of these and hopefully put them back into a normal sinus rhythm. Um, that is a less popular strategy nowadays, mainly because of all the risk associated with these drugs and risk for arrhythmias and whatnot. So um, not done frequently, but if you ever hear that term pill in a pocket, that's usually what this is referring to. Um, again, you can see here, um, mainly being used for superventricular arrhythmias or ventricular arrhythmias, so broad spectrum in terms of what it's gonna be treating, okay? Um, now, in, for, in terms of toxicity here, it's some things you want to be watchful for, including uh, VTAC that's very resistant to treatment. So obviously, that's not a very good thing you want to put your patient into. Um, if they have a history of asthma, you may want to be careful here because it can cause bronchospasm, um, seizures, thrombocytopenia. These are rare side effects, but again, um, are nasty enough that where we don't prescribe this super often unless we have a very good reason to do so. Typically, our cardiology people are going to be the ones that are prescribing this. Um, also, do not want to use this for patients having ventricular arrhythmia due to MI because you actually end up seeing higher mortality there, which is not great. 
And then propafenone is going to be the other uh, drug in this category here. It is uh, very similar to flecainide, but it also has a little bit of beta blocking activity. Um, again, you can see seizures with this one. You want to be careful if they have asthma, because again, bronchospasm and all of that cause bradycardia, all that kind of makes sense based off the beta blocking capability of these drugs here as well. Um, can worsen CHF. So again, pretty nasty from a side effect profile, so not used all that too frequently. So uh, in fact, I remember I had a case where um, we had a patient, I was actually um, during my fellowship at the Poison Center, um, part of my, my staffing responsibilities was to uh, take calls at the Poison Center. So I'd, you know, talk to, you know, Either parents calling because their kid, you know, drinks some bleach or something, or all the way to, to physicians calling up for consults on cases. And uh, I remember I did have a, a call one time of EMS um, personnel calling in. They say, "Hey, we got this kid here, history of congenital heart defects. Um, just took all of his propafenone." And I was like, "Oh boy, this is not good because um, basically, you know, once all these drugs here are soaking up all those sodium channels, and." They mentioned they have a slow dissociation rate. It's very difficult for them to be counteracted by really anything. And so life-threatening arrhythmia is the biggest concern at that point. So we had that patient being, I said, yeah, this patient is absolutely super big risk for death here. Like definitely get, because sometimes EMS will call us up to say, hey, is this a big deal or not? Do I need to transport them to the ER or not? And so um, I was like, yeah, get them in. ASAP, right? So then I ended up calling the physician at the hospital he's going to be going to. And I was like, hey, this is going to be a really difficult arrhythmia to treat. You know, make sure you just hit him with sodium bicarb. We try to do that to reset the sodium channels. Fortunately, the patient ended up dying. Um, but, you know, again, it's one of those things where, um, you know, you want to be really have good respect for certain drugs because they can be quite dangerous when being used. You always want to be very careful with them. Okay, um, so moving into our class two antiarrhythmics. Again, this is going to be pretty much a review for us. So, no. Nothing really notable here that is new other than just talking about them in the context of arrhythmias. So again, these are not going to be working on the fast response cells so directly, but they are going to be working on that nodal tissue, working on the automaticity of the heart. So they're going to slow down conduction and decrease automaticity. Um, you can see a little bit of a decrease in that phase 40 polarization, but the biggest thing here is it's taking longer for these action potentials to be generated in our nodal tissue, right? So the heart rate should be slowed down. So what is that good for? mainly good for supraventricular arrhythmias to try to um, slow down those really fast signals being sent from the atria down into the ventricles. That allows the ventricles to maintain a relatively normal rate, so that way they have good efficient filling, they're allowed to relax, fill up with blood, and to contract. They're not being signaled so quickly that they can't do that, and then your cardiac output suffers. Right? So, uh, again, I'm not going to go over every single beta blocker, but just speaking more broadly about these, things like propranolol or your non-selective beta blockers, some of these are a little bit better than others. Um, so, for instance, some of them can actually have what we call membrane stabilizing effects, so they can actually help to prevent further arrhythmias from occurring. So, something like propranolol actually has this ability. Um, again, clinically, it doesn't necessarily guide our choices all that too often, but some people may prefer the activity over others, usually your, your cardiology um, uh, colleagues there. But again, will D have negative inotropic effects. We want to be really cautious in patients with like CHF, for instance. Um, but the chronotropic effects are really what we're looking for to slow down that conduction from the atria to the ventricles. Okay. So as you can see here, occasionally we use it for um, ventricular ectopic beats, but uh, not as commonly used for, for those sort of indications there. And certainly we remember that for patients with MI, beta blockers are a preferred class of drugs, but obviously, you know, if they're bradycardic, if they're hypotensive, you're gonna be skipping those during the, that acute MI phase for sure. Um, we already know the side effects here of beta blockers to watch out for, things like heart failure, heart block, hyperglycemia, et cetera, et cetera. Remember for your non-selective beta blockers, watch out for that bronchospasm in patients with history of asthma, right? Um, to look at some of the um, cardioselective beta blockers, things like metoprolol, acebutalol, um, even things like esmolol like, might actually be a good one here. So we use this quite frequently for patients who are in um, uh, SVT, superventricular tachycardia. Um, this is a good one because it's a short-acting IV agent. So it's called Brevablock is the brand name. You can actually give it um, uh, to patients who are kind of resistant to other drugs just to get that heart rate slowed down enough where the ventricles can and beat at a normal rate there. And it's nice that it's short acting because I can titrate the dose pretty well. So if I start to see the patient get hypotensive, I can drop down the dose. If I start to see they're going back in the SVT, then I can bump up the dose. So very handy from that standpoint. Okay. 
Um, getting into our class three antiarrhythmics, these are going to be newer drugs here. Notice they don't have any effect on the depolarization. It's the repolarization they're primarily affecting. So by blocking potassium channel efflux, they're going to be extending out that refractory period. They're going to be extending out the time it takes for those cells to reset back to resting membrane potential. So, and again, that's going to help to disrupt those re-entrant arrhythmias that are happening there to try to reset the heart to go back into normal sinus rhythm, okay? Um, now, again, we've seen other drugs that prolong the QTC or the uh, block potassium channel efflux, and that's all the drugs we've talked about that cause QT prolongation. Your macrolides, your fluoroquinolones, drugs like that, these are doing the, kind of the same thing, okay? And that's why you end up seeing that QTC prolongation on those drugs is because they have the same effects as these class three antiarrhythmics, essentially. So the first one here is a very popular one you're going to see being used, especially a lot like in ERs. Um, you'll see it's being used for chronic use as well. Um, this is going to be amiodarone. Um, good long-term drug. Um, you know, it has oral IV uh, options that are available there. So we'll oftentimes use it in the IV form, like in the ER setting or the ICU setting, to try to get arrhythmias under control. And then once they're um, set on it, then we can put them on oral options, and people can be on this for years potentially. Um, now it does have a long half-life, like 40 days. You can see the range here anywhere between 26 to 107. Now remember how long it takes to get to half-life or get to um, steady state is about four to five half-lives. So if I had to wait five half-lives for a patient to get to steady state who's having, uh, I don't know, VTAC right now, I'd have to wait, you know, like 200 days, right? Not great. My patient's probably going to be dead by then. So what do we do to get around that? Well, that's why we give loading doses, right? You give really big doses right away in order to get the patient up to steady state, and then you can follow that up by an IV drip, some kind of maintenance dosing to keep them at that steady state. And so if you look at your ACLS guidelines, this is actually the first line drug they're gonna be using for patients who are having V-fib, V-tac, things like that. You'll see this used a lot for atrial fibrillation, uh, for rate, uh, rhythm control of that. Um, so a lot of uses for amiodarone, you'll see it used quite frequently there. <clears throat> So, and it has a lot of other activities. It's not just that it blocks potassium channels. That's its main activity. You'll see it has some sodium channel blocking effects, some beta blocking effects, all these things here. So it can decrease automaticity, can decrease conduction. Um, so you do want to watch out for things like affecting cardiac output, affecting blood pressure, affecting heart rate. Um, so those things are going to be part and parcel with use of amiodarone. So some of the other unique sort of side effects, though, that you're going to see with amiodarone, you might not see other places or with other drugs, are going to be things like the pneumonitis and pulmonary fibrosis. This is typically something that is going to be for the long term. So patients who are on this for decades potentially um, can develop this. You do want to watch like their pulmonary function test over time to make sure that that is not starting to develop there. Um, you can see things like neurotoxicity, some muscle weakness as a result of some of their actions on the neuronal tissue. Another unique one here is actually blue-gray skin discoloration. Again, that's a long-term effect as you get kind of a buildup of the drug chronically. Um, you can see eye effects, so you want to watch for visual acuity, making sure you're not having deposits there developing. You're like, wow, this sounds like a really bad drug. It can be. Um, but again, if this is the only thing that's really working for your patient, then that's it, right? So if I have someone who's in VTAC or VFib right now in the ER, and they're going to die unless we get them back into a normal rhythm, um, this is a good drug because I'm not really worried about those chronic side effects. But if you're taking it for like AFib and you're going to be on it for the next 20 years, that's where you're going to be more thinking about this. And so that's why you see for a lot of those patients who are transitioning away from drugs like this for rhythm control and switching more to a rate control sort of paradigm. That's again your beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, things like that. Um, now, because amiodarone, amiodarone itself is sort of an analog to thyroid hormone, interestingly enough, this can cause both hyper and hypothyroid um, symptoms. So you do want to watch their TSH levels and things like that. Again, it's more of a chronic effects there. And then you'll see a lot of interactions here, a ton of drug interactions. It will inhibit CYP2C9, 2D6, 3A4. So this one is another one that's rife with drug interactions. You want to be really careful if you're adding this on or if you're adding on a new drug where a patient's already on amiodarone, right? Now, a little bit cleaner agent in the class three category here is called the Fetalite or Ticacin. This is just a pure potassium channel blocker. That's all it does is not do any other ancillary actions that um, amiodarone has. And because of that, it is much more clean in terms of its side effects. You don't see pulmonary fibrosis. You don't see thyroid effects, things like that. Now, this is mainly used for more chronic uh, management of AFib for um, 
rhythm control to keep patients in normal sinus rhythm here. Um, now, this is another drug, like just like we talked about with like um, isotretinoin for um, for acne. Remember, we had to have special certification um, to even use the drug. You know, the patients had to be registered, providers had to be registered, all of that. This is kind of the same deal. It's another what we call a RIMS program, that risk evaluation and mitigation strategy. This is done in order to make sure that you don't have a family practice person who has no real experience of dealing with um, these drugs, prescribing this and potentially killing somebody versus you want to be someone who has like actually works in cardiology and who's board certified for that to be able to use this. Why do, why do we do that? Well, it's because the risk for torsades is quite high with this. Um, that's really the big side effect you're looking for is going to be this um, QT prolongation that can lead to torsades. Now, normal um you know qtc for individuals and it can range based on age and, and gender of the patient but for in general around like 440 milliseconds or something like that you will see a marked increase in qtc when giving someone defedilite and you have to make sure they don't have too big of a bump in that because if it starts to get the higher it goes the higher risk for torsades end up getting so once you start getting the 500s 550s things like that their risk is going to be going up pretty significantly so that's why you want to be really careful there um so that's why you got to get baseline EKGs. You have to make sure that their electrolytes are all, all under control. So you have to make sure their potassium looks good, make sure that their magnesium, their calcium, everything is in range. Because if you have any kind of electrolyte disturbances while introducing this drug, again, that increases your risk for arrhythmia. So you want to be really, really careful with that. Um, this is another one also that gets eliminated unchanged in the kidney. So if they have kidney dysfunction, they're going to hold on to this drug and you're going to see too big of a QT prolongation. So this is one of the drugs that's on your prescription assignment. And one of the things you want to be noteful of uh, when you're looking up the dosing and things like that is to look at the effects on the QTC because that will actually affect the dosing you're using as well. So which is one thing to note with that. All right. Now this is a weird one. You're like, wait a second. Soda law, it's a beta blocker. Why is it showing up in the class three? Are your slides out of sync? Not today. Could be other days, but no. Um, so soda law is kind of a weird one. Um, I haven't really talked about this too much because this is really the first place where it really becomes clinically important. It is a beta blocker, yes, but it actually does have some potassium channel blocking capabilities as well. And so we consider this to be a class three antiarrhythmic. And again, this is something used more so by your specialty providers, cardiology, things like that. Um, and is occasionally used for helping to control a fib, a flutter, things like that for the most part. Same side effects apply to this as the other non-selective beta blockers. It's just it has this additional ability to prolong the refractory period, prolong repolarization, just like a class 3 antiarrhythmic would. So and again, side effects you're going to see here, torsades because of the QT prolongation, bronchospasm because of the beta blocking effects, all of that, which you, know, you guys could be able to intuit based on the fact it's a beta blocker. All right, and then our class four antiarrhythmics here. These are our non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers. You will find very similar actions here as you will with the uh, beta blockers, right? The so negative inotropy, negative chronotropy, um, same contraindications, bronch um, um, you know, in terms of like hypotension, um, bradycardia, heart block, things like that. Um, typically used for rate control for patients with supraventricular arrhythmias, things like that. So very good set of drugs if you need to slow down the rate of the heart going from the atria to the ventricles, okay? I'll give you kind of a, a, an example case, kind of how we use these drugs um, together here in just a little bit. So as I mentioned, verapamil and diltiazem, you still got to know all the stuff we talked about with these drugs last time, right? So um, remember the drug interactions that can happen here. If you have a patient who's on a uh, CYP3A4 substrate and you add on verapamil or diltiazem, guess what? It's going to be affecting that. It's an inhibitor. That doesn't change just because we're on a new section of the class here. So those are things I want you to remember. But in terms of the activity, on the heart, remember, it's going to be decreasing contractility, decreasing heart rate. Um, so, again, same, similar contraindications as you'll see with the beta blockers there. So, you might know, asthma stuff and hyperglycemia and all of that. Um, mainly, you're going to see these being used for PSVT, AFib. Again, not useful for ventricular arrhythmia. Just like the beta blockers cannot be used for ventricular arrhythmias uh, because they just don't affect the ventricles that way, right? Unless you have something like sodalol affecting potassium channels. So, um, lastly, we're going to have our miscellaneous agents here. So we have adenosine, digoxin, or digitalis, and the magnesium sulfate. 
So adenosine is kind of an interesting drug, and if you've ever had the opportunity to see it being given, it is quite um, quite interesting. It's quite um, a dramatic drug uh, to be given here. But basically, you have adenosine uh, receptors all throughout your body. You have them primarily in the heart. You actually have them up in the CNS as well. When adenosine receptors are activated, they hyperpolarize the cells. Basically, they prevent all the action potentials from happening. So it can actually even stop the heart. Kind of weird. So a lot of people end up equating this drug um, to kind of like if your computer's not working all that well or your internet's not working very well, you can unplug something and replug it in. This is the physiologic equivalent of that with adenosine here. So we'll do this for patients, and this is a very particular drug we're going to be using for proxismal supraventricular tachycardia. Someone's coming in, they have a heart rate of 160, 180, 200 in some cases, like really little kids, you'll see that. Um, and you need to just shut the heart down for a second, reset it. This is the drug we're going to use for that. The way we do that is because we can do this because of the fact that adenosine has a very short half-life, about 10 seconds or so. So by the time that it shuts down the heart for a couple of seconds and it comes back on, the drug has been degraded and it's gone. Okay? Um, so pretty handy the way it does that. And it does it by, again, hyperpolarizing all those cells, preventing any action potentials from occurring. So typically what you'll see is a patient will be on a, uh, a continuous EKG. They're hooked up to a 12 lead EKG. They're on it, um, getting continuous readout from that. And then you'll push the drug very quickly, as we'll see. Um, you'll see the heart kind of go from having that PSVT where it's very rapid heart rate. It will then shut down for a couple seconds. You'll see like a flat line even. Patient's still conscious, patient's still there. Um, and then everyone's kind of like waiting on bated breath. To hopefully the heart's going to go back in the sinus rhythm and then hopefully they'll go back into it. Otherwise they'll go back in that CT and then, you know, the drug didn't work. So pretty cool to see. Uh, if you have an opportunity while in rotations to see this, I, I would recommend checking it out because it's pretty wild seeing someone's heart basically stop and then come right back online. Um, so there is some toxicity associated with this. Um, patients do not feel good when they take this drug. Um, you can see a lot of flushing associated with this, shortness of breath, burning in the chest, which kind of makes sense the way the drug is actually being used there or what it's doing. Um, one of the things to note with adenosine is that because that's such a short half-life, people frequently give this incorrectly. Now, someone coming into the ER with PSVT, they probably don't have central access to the venous supply, right? Because it's difficult to acquire. So they'll probably have a peripheral vein um, or peripheral catheter placed, right? Usually an AC or something like that. The problem with this drug is if you give it too slowly, by the time it gets to the heart, it's already been degraded away. It's not going to do anything, right? So what we end up doing is giving this um, very quickly. So it means, um, you know, usually when you say give something IV push, it means over a few minutes. This drug is being given as fast as that nurse or whoever's administering the drug can push it. Basically, they're slamming it into the patient, and then you got to slam in saline right afterwards to try to flush that drug up into the heart. And so a lot of people do this incorrectly. So I think the drug's not working when really they just didn't give it fast enough. So it's another important thing there. Typically, we'll have like a little contraption set up with a three-way stopcock to where we have one end going to the patient, one end hooked up to the adenosine, the other end hooked up to a, um, a syringe of saline. We'll slam in the adenosine, slam in the saline, and hopefully that will then get the drug up to the patient's heart and then reset their PSVT. Pretty cool drug. Uh, all right, uh, next up we have digoxin or digitalis. We've talked about this in context for its actions in uh, CHF. Remember we talked about those neurohormonal effects. Now we're more so talking about it in terms of its uh, utility on the heart, more for AFib. Um, again, not used all the time for AFib anymore, but um, can be useful there, especially if they have like concomitant AFib and CHF can be useful. Remember it's working by blocking the sodium potassium pump trying to take, uh, give it a longer time for the patient to get back that resting membrane potential, so it kind of prolongs the refractory period a little bit there, it's usually the, the relative refractory period, but also slow down AV conduction, right? So we've already seen how, kind of how that works. And you also get a little bit of an increase in parasympathetic tone in the heart, which kind of slows it down as well. So again, bradycardia is probably one of the more common things you're going to see with digoxin in terms of side effects, because it is kind of slowing everything down there and can induce heart block in some cases. So as I mentioned, um, can sometimes be used to slow down ventricular rate, not commonly done for this though, um, but can be useful for things like AFib and a flutter. As I mentioned, that's probably the more common thing you'll see there. Um, side effects still, you still wanna know about. So visual disturbances, uh, xanthopsia, um, you know, uh, things like the nausea vomiting you can see with this. Uh, remember to be careful if you're combining this with other um, 
negative inotropic drugs like calcium channel blockers and beta blockers because they can be synergistic and can lead to worsened heart block and things like that. Uh, the last drug we'll talk about here is magnesium sulfate. So just like we saw, um, you know, it's just a regular electrolyte, right? Um, so magnesium sulfate itself is really only used for one particular indication. And so if you take nothing else away from this lecture, you should at least be able to say, what is the treatment of choice for torsades? Magnesium sulfate. For whatever reason, this is the drug of choice for that. And it works very, very well for that. And so typically, um, if you have someone who's in torsades, this is typically either due to a congenital issue where they have a congenital prolonged QT or they have some electrolyte disturbance causing this or it is more often drug induced. So drug induced torsades is probably the most common thing I've run into at least, probably with most practitioners you'll see that. And so once you see that, and it's very particular, if you wanna look up a picture of torsades, it has a very particular look to it, it's called twisting of the points. Basically I draw it out for you, but you know my art is not the, the best. But uh, if you see that, magnesium sulfate is going to be the drug of choice for them. You slam in one to two grams, hopefully put them back in a normal sinus rhythm. Uh, in terms of toxicity, you can see some bradycardia, you'll see some flushing, and hypotension is frequently seen here as well. Uh, so you do want to be cautious of that. Respiratory paralysis is not super common. Uh, if you think about the doses that we're giving here, these are not real extreme doses because you'll look at pregnant patients with preeclampsia that get magnesium. They're getting like six, eight grams of the stuff, and they typically do fine, but it's a rare side effect you may see occasionally. All right, so that's it for this section. Do you guys have any questions on that so far? I'm not going to let you go yet. I want to get started on the oncology section just so I want to make sure we have enough time to get through everything because GI and oncology are fairly big sections. Well, my children are just going crazy out there. Oh, so I want to go through like a, a quick clinical situation you might run into just to kind of illustrate the different ways we can use antiarrhythmics. So um, this is a real life case we actually had um, probably a couple years ago. So we had a, a 10 month old patient come in uh, come in, patient was just not acting right, was not feeding well, was kind of just acting real lethargic. Brought the patient in, hooked him up to a monitor, found, wow, the kid's tacking away at like 180 to 200. Uh, kid was in PSVT, pretty clear there, right? So what do we do, right? So, you know, with PSVT, there's certainly non-pharmacologic means in order to treat that. So you can try to have the patient Valsalva down. Um, difficult to communicate that to a 10-month-old. So there's certain things you can do like ice packs, um, you know, to the to the neck, you can try to have them breathe through a straw, you know, things like that. But none of the non-pharmacologic means of treatment were really working for this patient there, right? So what do we do? Well, it's in PSVT. So we said, all right, well, the typical first line drug we're gonna use for that would be something like adenosine. So we ended up hooking up that little three-way stopcock I talked about. We gave first dose of adenosine, hopefully waiting for the patient to kind of reset the heart. Um, we saw the flat line for a second or two, and then it goes right back into PSVT. Try two total doses of adenosine for that patient there. It's still nothing, still resistant to, to that drug, okay? So we're saying, okay, well, you know, the big concern here, the patient still has a stable blood pressure, so the ventricles are still going okay. They're still doing their thing. Um, however, the risk is, is that the ventricles will tire out eventually. They can't keep going at that really rapid rate because otherwise they'll start to um, tucker out and then they're not gonna be able to maintain good cardiac output. So we're trying to prevent that patient from becoming unstable in terms of their blood pressure, right? Being able to perfuse. So we said, okay, well, let's try to use something to try to slow down that heart rate, right? So let's go ahead and try to use something like a uh, more of a rate control type of drug. So what do we go with? Well, you have two big options. You have beta blockers, you have your calcium channel blockers. We ended up opting for a calcium channel block. We ended up going with uh, deltaism, cardizem, drip. So we hooked that up, try to start to slow the rate down. It's helping, but it's not really getting the patient back to where we need. Um, and again, the risk for pushing too much of the calcium channel blocker is then the hypotension. So you gotta be really cautious of kind of balancing those two out. So that really wasn't being a good option either for this patient. So we're saying, okay, well, we're not running out of options. What else can we do? What's another drug we can try to use to try to convert that patient back into normal sinus? Well, let's try class three antiarrhythmic drug because those are typically more commonly used in a lot of the 1As. So we go the amiodarone. So then we try to bolus the patient with the amiodarone um, to get them back to normal sinus. Again, this is still not working. By this time, you got the ICU docs down there, you got the cardiology docs that are there, you got the ER docs. I mean, it's just, you know, it's a, it's a meeting of the minds basically to try to figure out what to do next for this patient who's still just sitting there tacking away. 
They ended up getting him on Cardizem Drip, and again, that was helping, but really not great. The Amateur Run really wasn't really working either, so we're like, okay, what else can we do? Again, the concern is the patient's going to tire out, and they're going to crump, and then now they're in cardiac arrest, right? So ultimately, what we ended up doing is getting the ECMO team in. ECMO, if you're not familiar, is something uh, it uh, stands for extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, where basically you put the patient on a bypass machine that takes blood out of the patient, will then oxygenate it, and then pump the blood back into the patient. It's essentially a, a lung heart machine to kind of take that stress off the patient's cardiopulmonary system and allow them to rest and recover. So we actually ended up putting that patient on ECMO um, in, uh, in the ER. Uh, before transferring them up to our, our cardiac ICU. So it was a very uh, dramatic case. It's not something we do too, too commonly. But again, sometimes, as, as much as I wish the drugs worked all the time, drugs are not always the answer, unfortunately, because they're not going to be working so well. But you can kind of see that stepwise approach that we took to that, kind of going through our list of different options there. And that's something you want to think about as a provider is to always consider, okay, if my plan A is not going to work, what's plan B? What's plan C? Because you may have the best plan in the whole wide world, but if the patient has an allergy or the drug's not working, you gotta know what to go to next, right? Hope that makes a sense. Um, let's see, going to the sticky board, someone said, it seems like the slamming administration of adenosine would ruin the IV side, especially in patients who are really ill, have poor vein anatomy. Have you ever seen this? Um, I don't think I've ever seen that in an adult patient. I have not. Um, that is a concern though, for sure, right? You worry about blowing the vein. Um, that's why you want to make sure that you get as like as deep of a vein as possible um, you have available. Um, honestly, I think I've really only seen this more so in a little bit younger patients. You know, by younger, I mean like, you know, middle age, not like the real elderly. Um, those are the patients I'd be more concerned about there from, from the anatomy standpoint. Um, but obviously, if the patient is unstable, so like for instance, if they are gotten to the point where they're hypotensive because they can't perfuse any longer because the, the ventricles are starting to, to tire out, um, at that point there, we more consider that to be uh, a case where you could use electricity, right? Um, that's the other thing I forgot to mention with that other case I've mentioned there. Um, electricity is always an option as well. You can always try to defibrillate the patient basically to uh, put them back into a normal sinus. That as well was not uh, successful for that patient. Um, obviously, I forget some of the stuff because I don't think about the drugs, but yeah. So, you know, the, you, have, you have several options that are there. So if you had someone who had a really poor, um, yeah, a very tenuous IV um, access, you could always try going with the electricity option, right? You can go with the electrical option there. Um, but yeah, so at least the only way I'm seeing it. And again, with kids too, like they have pretty poor anatomy as well. So again, when I'm saying slamming, I'm talking about with the course like a second or two, um, as, at least as fast as that um, resistance will allow, right? Um, so again, yeah, you worry about that, but uh, you know, that's that's a concern. But you, know, you got to get that drug to the heart. So kind of have to take the good with the bad there. A very good question. Okay, so let us transition into our talks of oncology. So what is cancer? Well, cancer is basically where we have these cells that are just replicating, they're growing sort of ad infinitum. They are just gonna keep growing until they take over the whole patient basically. Excuse me, I feel like I have a sneeze going on. I apologize, I had this in another lecture too where I felt like I had a sneeze coming on like three or four times and so every time I stop, then it goes away. So it's very, uh, very frustrating, but regardless so what we're going to see here with uh cancer cells is they typically are lacking a lot of the factors that normally tell our healthy cells to stop growing or to stop replicating here so this means that they could have increasing growth factors they have decreased um, contact inhibition which is something to where normally if your cells are getting all bunched around one another and they're all in close contact that normally says hey we got enough cells here we don't need to grow any further they lose that uh, they will lose the ability to undergo apoptosis, which is something that is controlled by that P53 gene. They can kind of lose that. Um, and so, um, you know, basically that makes these cells immortal, essentially, uh, where they do not want to cause that program cell death, that cell suicide. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the issue here. You have all these different factors that are going on um, that lead to these cells just continuing to grow, replicate, they spread. That's where you can end up developing kind of, you know, deleterious effects of the patient as we're going to see here we have these metastases and all that now um we may not know the etiology of cancer in all cases and, and frequently it's multifactorial and one of the big things i'm going to show you with uh 
you know, this set of drugs here is that because cancer is so, um, so broad, right? So it's like trying to try to condense down all of oncology drugs into one lecture is is really difficult. Um, I could do whole classes, whole electives just on cancer drugs. So I will be limiting our scope here to basically getting over the uh, basic logistics, basic uses of these drugs here. I'm not going to get real specific and to say for prostate cancer, this is how you treat it. For you know, for breast cancer, this is how I treat this. For lung cancer, here's how I treat this. That's outside of our scope, and I can't get that specific here. That's going to be more so for like your medicine courses. Um, what I will do, though, is try to give you a basic overview of how we target these cells with our cancer drugs, how the drugs work, and what kind of toxicities you're going to see, drug interactions, and all of that. Um, because I think that's going to be sort of the most kind of high yield stuff we're going to be able to get out of this. So you're not going to find a test question that's going to say which of these four drugs is you or five drugs is used to treat lung cancer outside of our scope right but i will say which one of these drugs causes this particular side effect or this drug interaction and that is the stuff i want you to see because of the fact that whether you're dealing with prostate cancer lung cancer leukemia there's a lot of crossover of these drugs you're going to see that um, they will have uh, you know the ability to treat multiple types of cancers but again you can't really specific on each type of cancer and that's again outside of our scope so hopefully that makes a sense You'll see that as we get into it. So um, whereas with like arrhythmias, I can be a little bit more specific about that being say this one treats superventricular arrhythmias versus this one treats both. Um, this is going to be a little bit more broad than that. So just FYI. So anyway, so again, the etiology of cancer can be multifactorial, can be genetic, can be uh, due to a whole host of different factors there. But in general, what you're going to find is that there's some sort of initiation, some sort of genetic mutation, some sort of exposure to a carcinogen, et cetera. And it's going to then uh, allow for these cancer cells to then start to grow. They'll have some kind of promotion factors, uh, some kind of promotion phase where the environment is going to be more favorable for them to propagate. Right. So whether it be a patient's diet, their environmental exposures, maybe ongoing exposure to things like, um, uh, you know, uh, carcinogens found in uh, smoking, uh, certain medications, things like that. And then you have the progression there. Right. The cancer cells proliferate. And they start to metastasize and invading sort of surrounding tissues. So. Um, now, there's a lot of known carcinogens that are out there. I just wanted to show you a few drug-induced causes for cancer. Um, again, there's no reason to memorize this list here. I just wanted to show you that um, while we want to do no harm by initiating drugs for our patients, that we know that this is going to be a risk with some medications here. So, for instance, if you're going to be administering things like estrogens, so even things like certain uh, oral contraceptives, estrogen replacement therapy itself carries a risk for cancer because what do these anabolic hormones do where they stimulate the tissue to grow and thus that growing tissue can potentially be cancerous cells, right? You see the same thing on the anabolic steroids like testosterone and things like that. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention too is that any of, just like with antiarrhythmics, any antiarrhythmic itself can induce an arrhythmia just like with that, any uh, chemo drug that we use for oncology can actually cause cancer in and of itself. So they can be carcinogenic in and of themselves. We know this is a risk, but we have to take the good with the bad. So if we don't treat this one cancer, it's going to kill the patient. Then we'll worry about the next cancer that pops up if it does, right? They're low risk, but it's a risk, okay? Anyway, so a lot of different varieties of drugs out there that can all cause this. And a lot of these you haven't seen before because we'll talk about them here when we get into our specific agents. So, and again, you can see why these cells um, are become cancers, right? There are a lot of different things here. So things like, um, you know, evading growth suppressors or um, uh, enabling that replicative immortality, uh, which is actually in the name of my uh, prog rock band back in, um, back in high school. Um, but, you know, basically, you know, things like these tum uh, telomerases you have on the uh, DNA that basically get turned off. So I don't, they stop chopping off bits of the DNA, make the cells, they can just replicate kind of ad infinitum, they can just keep going, uh, whereas other cells might not do that. Uh, they can do things like increase angiogenesis, so they have new blood supply coming to it. Um, so lots of different factors here that lead to these cells becoming cancerous, essentially. So a couple of theories here. So for um, when looking at this, and again, treating cancer is a multimodal, um, it typically involves a multimodal approach, meaning you can deal with radiation, you can have surgery, and then you're gonna have the chemotherapy. And frequently, we're going with multiple steps there, and this is some of the reasons why. Uh, because one, if you leave a single tumor cell behind, 
that has the ability to replicate and then continue propagating that tumor, right? So our goal is to try to kill every single cancer cell we can, okay? You're also gonna find that different tumors may have different growth patterns based on the stage of disease that, right? So depending on, um, you know, for instance, like leukemias, you know, your white blood cells grow at a really fast rate anyway. So that's a very fast growing sort of tumor there, right? When you're uh, producing all these new white blood cells that are cancerous. Um, as opposed to other ones that may grow more slowly. So for instance, things like prostate cancer typically is a very slow growing sort of cancer. So there's different f factors that go into that depending on how fast the cells are replicating. Um, whether the disease is really localized or disseminated. If you have a brain tumor, typically it's located right to the brain. If you have a leukemia, it's everywhere in the body. So that can dictate what kind of therapies you can use as well. It's hard to you know, undergo surgery to treat a leukemia because you can't get all the cells with surgery, right? So we have to go with more systemic means of treating that. And then we also talk about the heterogeneity of the tumor, meaning are there multiple cell types that are there um, that may be more resistant to certain treatments than others, as we'll see. Um, cancer cells also undergo what they call Gompertian cell growth, which again is another good way to impress your friends. Uh, when and using esoteric terms and whatnot, but basically every tumor takes sort of a constant amount of time to double its size and that can vary widely depending on the cell type that it is whether it's a white blood cell or whether it's a prostate cell for instance and as you're going to see is that as the tumor grows in size that growth fraction tends to decrease and this is typically due to the fact that the tumor is outgrowing its nutrient supply if it can't get blood supply to that tumor uh, if you can't get good nutrients and oxygen flow and things like that, then the cells cannot replicate. They are at least still beholden to needing those sorts of uh, nutrients and whatnot in order to grow. Um, so cancer can't even outbeat that. So what that means is, is that initially you're going to see a very fast initial phase of growth, and then it will start to flatten out. You'll see a plateau phase that typically occurs here. And so this is what it would look like. So if you see this curve here growing, and you can see the cell number here on the Y category or Y uh, axis here. You can see it growing, 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 and eventually it's going to then flatten out at a certain point. Okay. So what's interesting here is you're going to see that, um, you know, even if you were to do a, a therapy where you were able to get rid of like, you know, just a huge number of cells here, actually, you're able to surgerize the patient at diagnosis, you were to get them down here to say 10 to the third cells. That's still a lot of cells left over that are available to then replicate themselves and kind of go back to right where you were. So this is why we're going to go with the multimodal approach in order to um, try to get rid of every single cell we have. Because even if you get 99.9% .9 of those cells killed, you could still have hundreds of thousands of cells left over that can continue to grow and replicate, right? So um, as I mentioned, treatment should involve the removal of the tumor if it's um, reasonable, right? So obviously like a leukemia, that's not going to be possible. But if it's like a solid tumor or something, that can be very useful. So surgery is very good for that, right? For well-localized, well-differentiated tumors. Radiation therapy is going to be better for tumors that are localized but can't really be easily gotten to. So maybe like a really deep like brain cancer or something like that. And then chemotherapy is going to be better for systemic effects that are going to be able to get all the cells body-wide because a lot of the drugs we're administering with chemotherapy will be systemic in nature, okay? This is where I come in, right? We're talking about the actual drugs here. The problem is, is that with surgery, you know, what cells are really at risk for toxicity from surgery? Well, whatever cells the surgeon's actually cutting into right there, right? With radiation therapy, again, it's being localized to a certain area so that really those cells may be the ones that really are gonna be hit, but it's gonna save a lot of the other tissue. Whereas with chemotherapy, when I inject a chemotherapeutic drug into a patient's vein, that affects the entire body. That means healthy cells are going to be affected just like cancer cells are. And that's where you're going to see so many side effects that are associated with those. Okay? So again, and this is why we go with a multimodal approach. So for instance, you could have patients who um, can undergo surgery for maybe a well-localized tumor here to knock down the cell count, but you need something else in order to get rid of those remaining cells. And so this is where we're going to go with things like chemotherapy or radiation potentially. Now you notice we have these kind of stepwise approaches here. Like why these little shark fins? Like why do, why do we do that, right? Why not just give them enough chemotherapy to where the cells just go down to zero? Well, because you're affecting all the healthy cells in the patient too. And so that'll probably kill them before. It, but at the same time, you get rid of those cancer cells, you get rid of all the healthy cells in a person too, right? So we have to go through these cycles of administration of chemotherapy to give the patient a chance to recover because 
any rapidly dividing cell, whether cancerous or not, is going to be affected by our chemotherapy. So what kind of rapidly dividing cells do you think about in the body typically? Well, we think about our GI tract, constantly producing new GI cells. You want to think about things like your um, blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells for sure, your, um, platelets. Uh, you want to think about the hair too. Hair and nails can be affected. We see alopecia is a very common side effect of these drugs. So point being is you have to give uh, chemotherapy to knock down the, the cancer cells, but you have to give the body time to recover. And then you give another round, knock them down, give another round, knock them down. And so we do that in this uh, sort of a cyclical approach in order to allow the patient to recover, give time for their healthy cells to recover, knowing that the cancer cells are growing too, and then hit them again. The ideal thing would be if we had drugs that just affect cancer cells, but that's going to be difficult to do, even though that is becoming more of a reality nowadays. But we're going to look at more of the broad spectrum, sort of old school chemotherapeutic drugs that we use uh, every day, basically. So um, again, looking at this, we're going to see that we're trying to maximize our benefit to risk ratio because, and again, when I went to school, you know, I like to make patients feel better. You know, that's why I went to toxicology. Patient, patients are trying to kill themselves with drug overdoses. I like to reverse that. I like to give antidotes. You know, can, chemotherapeutic drugs are basically can, are, uh, basically poison. You know, we're basically poisoning the body to try to get rid of these cancerous cells here. So um, there's marked risk with doing this. And so we got to try to maximize the benefit. So we're, we, we kill cancerous cells as much as we can while sparing healthy cells. And so that's why we're going to see a lot of, I apologize, my toddler decides she wants to knock on the door. But, um, and again, so this is why we're going to see so many significant toxicities associated with these drugs here, myelosuppression being a big one, right? So infection risk is huge with these patients because as we're giving drugs to decrease the cancer cell load, we're also decreasing our white cell count, neutro uh, um, uh, neutrophils in particular. You'll see neutropenia being a big side effect with these. And oftentimes, <clears throat> at least why I see it, it's not the cancer is really going to kill these patients off. It's the secondary infections they get um, that lead to their demise ultimately, right? So you can have fungal infections. You can have uh, tuberculosis. You can have um, you know, PJP pneumonias, all kinds of other really nasty opportunistic infections that can happen that healthy patients would not have otherwise, right? All right. So what do we do here um, in terms of our dosing? Just like I showed you on that graph a second ago, typically go with high dose intermittent scheduling. So we'll give them a blast of chemotherapy, try to knock down as many of those cancer cells as we can, and then give the body time to recover, okay? Um, we'll talk about some other strategies and some things we're looking for as well. And so we also wanna make sure that when we're giving chemotherapy, we're targeting drugs that are in the active cell cycle. Now I know you probably haven't thought about your cell cycle since probably undergrad bio or something like that, but we're gonna talk about the cell cycle briefly here. And then we wanna see where the tumor is in the growth curve. So, you know, if you were to look back at that graph here, you know, if the tumor's close to that plateau phase, there's not a lot of those cells that are rapidly dividing. So chemotherapy is not gonna be as effective versus down here where the cells are gonna be very active in terms of replication or chemotherapeutic drugs are gonna be much, much more effective. That's another thing we're gonna be focusing there. So here is our cell cycle. If you recall, uh, you know, we typically have the G0 phase, which is where most of your cells are just kind of chilling, they're kind of doing their thing. You know, if it's a nerve, it's conducting uh, signals along, kind of doing whatever. Um, most of your cancer cells are not gonna be in G0 phase. They're gonna be in the active replication phase, right? So they're undergoing uh, G1 here. The biggest thing we're gonna start to see is the S phase, where if you recall, this is where we start to generate new DNA. This is gonna be a big target for a lot of our drugs. And you can see on this slide here, different places that our um, chemotherapeutic drugs can interact with the system, okay? So this is a handy slide to go back to and review um, if you wanna see where the drugs are working at specifically, because this is something I may ask uh, for the test, for instance, right? And I don't, this will be apparent based off of the um, mechanism of the drugs as well that we'll get into probably next time if I had to guess. Uh, so looking at this, so we're going to see that the S phase is where we're producing new DNA. We then have the G2 phase, where then you're also having like some more cell replication processes and whatnot. This is getting ready to enter the M phase or the mitosis phase, right? So we'll find certain drugs work specifically there. And then now you have two new cancer cells after it undergoes that. Now, some drugs are cell cycle specific where they work best if given when a lot of the cancer cells are in, particularly like the S phase or the mitosis phase. Some drugs are what we call cell cycle nonspecific, and they kind of work at any point, okay? Um, so these are gonna be things like our alkylating agents that we'll get into in just a little bit later. 
Okay, so again, this is um, kind of going over that. Like I talked about, you can review that if you like. Um, again, ideally we want to hit uh, these cancer cells when they're in as rapidly of a dividing phase as possible because that's when they're most likely to be in the S phase, in the M phase, and all of that. Okay, so to talk about like the how many of those cells are in a particular phase there, that's where we talk about things like the growth fraction. So obviously we want to be targeting drugs or targeting tumors that have a high growth fraction because those are the cells that are actively replicating. And then you can also talk about things like the S fraction or the basically the number of cells that are in the S phase producing new DNA. And that kind of implies sort of the aggressiveness of the tumor, right? And that goes also into the doubling time, how long it takes for the, the cancer to double in volume. So a shorter doubling time means it's replicating much more quickly. It means it's more of aggressive of a tumor. So now we're actually giving chemotherapy. It's important that we try to minimize our toxic, uh, toxic effects. We also want to minimize resistance. So just like uh, bacteria become resistant to antibiotics, your cancer cells through rapid replication and mutation can also become resistant to chemotherapy, right? So we're going to see some issues with that that we'll try to get around. But ideally, we use combination therapy to try to mitigate that. So by using two drugs instead of one, sometimes you can minimize the toxic effects and minimize that resistance there. Okay. And then we also want to focus on adjuvant therapy. I'll talk about that briefly. And we'll actually get into that quite a bit in the GI section later on. But this is where we're giving drugs that support the patient through all the side effects of the chemotherapy. So I'm sure um, many of you uh, may know this, but for instance, like if you ever watched a show like Breaking Bad, um, very, very good te television show. Um, but uh, you see a lot of the side effects that Walter White deals with with getting chemotherapy. Um, a lot of this is, is uh, due to the drugs themselves. It's not the cancer that's harming the patient. It's the actual drugs. And so we have to support them with our adjuvant therapy, things like antiemetic drugs, things that help stimulate the bone marrow to start to grow again so that way you can start to produce new white cells for infection, right? So those are all things uh, we're going to talk about at uh, great length later on here. So uh, other things to consider too is the timing of chemotherapy. If we have non-cell cycle specific drugs, it doesn't matter when you give it because it's always going to affect those cancer cells regardless. But sometimes we'll find that we want to target certain uh, drugs when cells are going to be most likely in, say, for instance, the S phase or the M phase. And that's why we can give drugs either like continuous infusions or sometimes we'll give them as multiple doses in a close time frame. Um, so as an example, to kind of give you an idea of how patients typically get chemotherapy. And again, I can mostly speak from a pediatric standpoint. Um, I've not dealt really much at all with adult uh, cancer, but every time I work in Amores, I get to deal with patient, you know, pediatric cancers um, and administering those drugs. Not, I mean, not me administering, but patients getting these drugs and processing the orders and all that. Um, so one of the things you're going to see is that patients may come in for more intermittent scheduling. So they'll come into our infusion center once a week, um, once a month, whatever the case may be based on their regimen. Sometimes they'll come in patients so that way they can get like five days worth of a drug. They'll get it Q24 hours for five days. The point of that is to try to make sure you're getting as many of those cancer cells in that particular phase as possible to try to get a higher kill count basically. And then as I mentioned, we give these in cycles, um, usually a defined repeating schedule, and then that allows time for the body to recover. Yes, we know that our chemo, our cancer cells are growing as well, but the idea of things is we can't kill off the patient, we need them alive. Otherwise, you know, it's not gonna be very good therapy. And this is typically determined by clinical trials. You'll find that a lot of patients who are getting chemo drugs are on a some kind of study, especially in pediatrics, we do that quite frequently as well. So here's an example I wanted to show you. Um, this is a called a roadmap. Most patients will have a roadmap who are on chemotherapy. And so this is for um, a particular uh, type of cancer. This is for an ALL patient. This is uh, for a study where they got randomized to a certain arm of that study here. And so you'll find there's different phases of chemotherapy treatment. This is one called consolidation. And so um, why I'm showing you this is to give you an idea of kind of the combinations of therapy patients can get and how they're actually administered. So for example, here, um, here's a list of drugs that they can be getting. We're gonna go over each one of these uh, in the following slides, but things like cyclophosphamide, cytarabine, or captopurine. Um, one of the things you'll note with um, oncology people is they love their, um, their acronyms. So for instance, cyclophosphamide is frequently known as CPM or cytarabine's ARC. Um, I will show you the um, acronyms here just for informational purposes only. Again, on the test, I will put generics and, and brand names just like normal. 
So you can see the route they're getting it. You can see the dosages there, the days they're going to be getting this. And notice sort of the inter or the um, uh, you know the intermittent periods are getting this, the cyclical periods are getting this. And so you can see here on day, so you can see day one, two, three, four, all the way down to you know to the first month. And again, I apologize, my toddler's like really trying to get into my room, but um. Basically, you can see here they get cyclophosphamide just one time for this particular cycle, right? They get one big dose right here, whereas with ROC, they're getting it for four days in a row. Then they get a little bit of a break, and they get it for another four days in a row. Meanwhile, they're getting six mercaptopurine every day during this time period, right? And then intermittently, they'll get intrathecal methotrexate. So, um, again, the point being here is by giving drugs through these cycles, they're trying to get as big of a kill count as they can, but giving the patient time to recover such that they are not going to have, you know, massive myelosuppression, be at massive risk for infection and all of that stuff, right? So, um, again, don't memorize anything from this other than some of the concepts we're kind of going over um, that kind of reinforce what we talked about before. And notice here too, observations um, and, and monitoring is super important for these drugs here, right? So making sure you're looking at their CBC with uh, diff, making sure you're looking at um, their LFTs, looking at their, um, you know, things like for osteonecrosis that can happen with some of these drugs. So all these are really, really important to monitor for to make sure your patient can get those drugs, right? So now nowadays too, like, you know, we are trying to find means of targeting cancer cells more specifically so that way we can save our healthy cells. And so that's where some of our newer biologic therapy can be really useful here. So for instance, if we have certain cancer cells that express a particular mutation, they express a certain protein that non-cancer cells don't, then let's target that. That way we can be really specific for those cancer cells. And that's where we can get into things like growth factor inhibitors. That's where we'll see like some monoclonal antibodies and things like that, or drugs that can actually help boost our own immune system in order to take out those cancer cells. So we'll look at a few um, options that are there. This is really a booming market there for chemotherapeutic drugs. You're going to see there's a gazillion of them that are out there. Um, I'm not going to get into all of them. I'm mainly going to be talking about really the more common, kind of older school cancer drugs. They're still the cornerstone of therapy. It's just that they're also going to see that they're not as specific for cancer cells. They're also going to cause a lot of toxicity. But this is the future of this. Hopefully, one day we'll have a specific drug for every type of cancer out there. They'll have to limit all those side effects, and I won't even have to give this lecture anymore, right? And then, obviously, early detection and treatment is super important. Make sure patients are getting screenings when they're supposed to, getting their paps when they're supposed to, getting um, their uh, self-checks for breast cancer and testicular cancer, all that stuff. Because uh, the earlier you can catch this stuff, the much better your outcomes are going to be, okay? And then, as I mentioned, um, in terms of toxicity, this is one of the key things we're going to be focusing on for these lectures here is the toxicity you'll see these drugs. Um, is again, because they're killing rapidly dividing cells, they're going to be affecting certainly the cancer cells, but the bone marrow. So risk for infection is huge. They're going to be affecting the GI tract, so you can actually end up finding that um, you can have oral ulcerations, you can have intestinal ulcerations that happen here, so stomatitis is a big thing. A lot of times patients have really poor PO intake because their mouths are so sore that they can't swallow um, liquids and food appropriately. So now their nutrition is also taking a hit. And so that again affects their immune system even further, right? Or if they have all these little lesions in their mouth, that can be a source for infection. So again, good oral hygiene is really important for these patients, um, even though they have these, the, these ulcers that can be very, very painful. Um, certainly alopecia can be another thing that is um, kind of classically thought about with chemotherapy. Not every drug will do this, but certain ones do more so than others. Um, and then certainly the reproductive cells will be hit here. So you see a lot of menstrual irregularities, um, you know, spermatogenesis may be affected here. Also, these are not patients you want to get pregnant while on these um, chemotherapeutic drugs because what is a fetus other than a mass of rapidly dividing cells, right? So you can see that all of these drugs are going to be triadogenic on a developing fetus. So um, you know, certainly something you definitely want to have good education on, good prevention to make sure they do not uh, get pregnant while on these drugs here. So um, I don't have enough time to really start to get into the drug specifically. So I think I'm going to go ahead and let you guys go a little early if that's okay with you all. I hope you're not going to be too terribly sad that I let you go about 20 minutes early. I think I'll have enough time to get through this and then start with GI and all that stuff next time. So I think we have two more class sessions after this. Um, all right, Lindsay's saying, when giving chemo to the cell, uh, cell cycle-specific patient, 
Um, how would you know when the patient's in a specific cell cycle phase like S phase or M phase? Very good. Um, well, you don't know, right? So we also know um, that different cells may be at different points during that cycle there. But if you look at the that roadmap I showed you, notice here you give ARIS-C as four intermittent doses. So if you look back up here to the dosing, you're given 75 milligrams per meter square per dose, and you're given that um, on days one through four, eight through 11. The point of giving it for those four days in a row is that you're going to be able to get hopefully all of those cancer cells as they enter the S phase or the M phase, right? In particular, ARC affects the S phase because it affects DNA production, which you'll learn about next week. But basically what you're seeing is by giving that four days in a row, or for instance, with six more captopurine, this is given every single day, you're going to be able to get all those cells as they, as they enter that phase. So it's not a matter of like, you know, kind of looking at the patient and being like, okay, you look like you're in S phase right now. It doesn't work that way. But by our dosing uh, strategies like this, um, by giving over the course of several days, you hopefully will get all of those cells as they enter those different phases there, if that makes a sense. Okay. Um, any other questions? If not, you guys are free to go. I think we still have class next week. I'm trying to see when. I think it's um, the week following is when Thanksgiving is happening. So we probably won't, will not meet on Black Friday. But you know, I think yeah, we'll have another class session after that. So um, all right. Well, if you guys have any questions in the meantime, feel free to email me. Or if you want to stick them up on the sticky board, I can get to it next week. Um, that way everyone can hear about it. Otherwise, have a great weekend. And I will see you all next time. All right, I'll see you guys later. Have a good one.